The part of which uh, was mentioned earlier, identify your lead safety person. Who's that going to be? Normally, we think it's going to be the first AD. They're running the set. They're what would be called the competent person. One thing to understand, the way OSHA looks at things, there's a definition of a competent person, and there's a qualified person. Qualified is someone who has the ability, the knowledge, the experience to do a particular task. When it comes to scaffolding, that would be our friends, the grips. Right? You're not going to see a producer putting up scaffolding. They're just going to bitch about how long it's taking. Uh, the competent person is someone who can uh, recognize an existing danger or hazard and has the authority, the legal authority, to do something about it. They can say, hey, uh, Grips, that scaffolding is missing one entire side. Uh, let's take it down or let's make it safe or let's do whatever. And that might be the AD. Uh, it may get designated to somebody else. If there's a lot of stunts going on, who do you give that power to? The PAs, of course, yes, because they know everything. Um, yeah, the stunt coordinator is going to do it. If there's a lot of pyro going on, your special effects coordinator, <laughs> absolutely, you do not defer that to anyone other than the effects coordinator, okay? Uh, but there may be other things in, in building or construction foreman or whoever. So that title of the competent person can change uh, within a given day. Okay, so you want to know who that's going to be, and you as the producer are probably going to be the one that designates that and says, okay, for the next two hours, Billy Bob, the stunt guy, you're in charge, and then after that when we blow up the house, Bobby Bob, you're going to be in charge, and, you know, the whole Bob family has been involved in this thing. Also, um, also one of the things also with the competent person is an awful lot of times you as a producer don't want to and probably shouldn't give up total authority. You're obviously gonna to listen to the stunt coordinator and the, those different people, but you're still the one who's kind of in control. If they're telling you that this is absolutely gonna hurt and kill people, yeah, you gotta to listen to them. But at some point, you're listening to those experts you've hired, you're listening to those people you've hired, okay? And then you work together with everybody. Again, the collaboration, this is all about the collaboration. And that's where they communicate with your cast and crew comes in, not communicate to. A lot of producers are just like, you will do this and you'll be happy and then you'll get your paycheck and get out of my face. Um, if a, the aforementioned PA says, well, I saw something, this isn't safe, make sure that they know it's okay to bring it up because they're maybe seeing something that nobody else did. That could be the act that saves somebody from stepping on a nail or you know, any other tragedy that can happen. So communicate with your crew, not necessarily to your crew. And, and one of the things that was asked to stick in with a couple of instances, doing a, a silly show where electricity took over the, the house, the evil electricity, and the mother is going to be killed by the electricity. So the electricity created and superheated the water in the water heater. And when mom goes into the shower stall, uh, the electricity creates an electromagnetic field that she's locked into this, and you're going to have the hot water kill her. Okay, so that's the scene that's set up that we're all set to shoot. And they asked the grips to take cribbing and a C clamp and lock the, the uh, stall shut, okay? close it so the actress could fight against it, trying to get out of the, from this, this hazard, this danger that's coming out. And um, what do you use to create steam that won't hurt the actor? Dry ice, right? Well, what's dry ice? Carbon dioxide, right? And it's heavier than the water or, it's, or than the air. It actually dissipates the oxygen. So we as the grips, who aren't necessarily, it's not our job, but in consultation we told the producer, I said, we can't do this. And they go, why? Or the AD, we can't do this, why? He goes, because you're gonna be displacing the oxygen, the actor isn't gonna be able to breathe and she's, we're gonna to have to take a C-clamp off to get to her. We'll hold on to it, we'll keep it, and we'll fight, make it easy to fight it, okay? But immediately we could release it if something goes bad. So again, listening cooperation or collaboration with the crew in what's going on. Again, the, yes sir, question, hey. Hi Dale. Hi. We've done it. We've done it a few times. This piece of paper on your desk here uh, gave me a thought. We've always put out a piece of paper with a phone number that you could call and text if there's an emergency. So every everyone had a quick communication to somebody if they saw a problem or you know had to report something. Exactly. A lot of times the, the first AD's phone number will be on a call sheet so someone can call that. They have the information for the local hospital. So where they know where to go in case, if you have a satellite crew, you got the main crew shooting in a farmhouse, but 
you know, the grips and the electrics are out rigging uh, the barn or something, and somebody gets hurt there, they may not have time to go back up to first unit, so they want to know where to go, how to be safe, what to do. There should be a medic on set. You've got to determine, do I need a medic on set or at least someone trained in first aid? Two different definitions there. I know a medic can do all the good stuff and has all the good stuff in their kit, um, but someone trained in first aid can at least put a bandage on or pull a splinter out or something like that. But you do want to make sure that your entire crew, not just the shooting crew, is covered. I know in LA, when we, we have the infamous uh, Fifth and Broadway Alley that uh, you've seen on TV and it smells like everything you've ever seen on TV before, and they'll go in and lice all the daylights out of it for the shooting crew, for the actors and the director and everybody. But when the uh, set dressing crew goes in beforehand, it's got every homeless person in LA and rats and roaches and puddles of things that we won't go into. Uh, but that's what the art department has to deal with. And so we're always pushing to say, look, you got to clean it up for everybody. So that's something, again, as a producer, you got to think of it's not just the actors, it's not just the shooting crew, but everybody in your office, in your editing room, wherever they may be, you got to take care of everybody. And so uh, establishing your program procedures will cover that. What do we do for the office? What do we do for the set? And are we in a forest or are we in a factory or whatever it's going to be? You've got to establish a program, uh, preferably a written program, and then communicate that to your department heads and ultimately your entire crew. And this is part of the thing that the gentleman just talked about is um, I believe in the document from contract services it has the studio safety hotlines. And the studios all have a hotline and not that the, the crew can put in anonymously. I believe your phone number's on it, too. Uh, yeah, or, there's, a, there's a safety, I, there's a, there's a contract is, services number somewhere. It's not you. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And your home address. Yeah. Yeah. And not saying anything, but what the calling contract services hotline, usually it sends it to the studio, which is is fine, that they're, they're trying to do something, there's a number to go to. The IA has a hotline, uh, local, there's so, local 600 members here, they have a hotline for what's going on. The IA's hotline, while we don't really have money coming from the non-union world to do this, I am the, you don't have to call the hotline anyway, you can just call me, because I'm the guy who gets it anyway, um, is the IA has instructed me to handle any calls. There was somebody here who um, she had called uh, uh, last uh, year, and you know she said, well, I'm non-union stuff, and I don't know if I gave her good advice, but she, she didn't hit me when she saw me, so I guess it was all right. <laughs> um, but it's things, is because we are a community, how we do this th stuff together. So you, it is about the communications. Set up a way that, that people can talk. And these are a number of the ways that you can do that with your call sheet, which nowadays is a lot of times sent out via computer rather than a physical piece of paper on set. And of course, the people who don't check their computer when they get home, they have no idea where they're going the next day. That would be me. Um, but um, safe, daily safety meetings. Good idea to always have one, even if it's a two or three minute one, say, here's what we're doing today, and it's just two people talking at a table, not a lot going bad. But then tomorrow, we're going to do the alligator scene and set the house on fire. A little bit more involved on that one. Um, so your daily safety meetings, and then what we call a uh, tailgate talk a lot of times, meeting at the back of the grip truck, where they keep all the fine beverages of Coca-Cola and water and such, um, to discuss what's happening in a particular scene with stunts or effects or something that's more uh, risk aggressive. So you want to have individual meetings for all of that. You even, ha um, you even have, um, especially like on construction crews, which are more traditional construction, because we generally fall into the general industry clause of OSHA, but there are times we fall into the construction when there's certain things going on. Most of the studios have packets that are, tail they call them toolbox talks, tailgate talks are all part of the vernacular for uh, the safety industry that the construction uh, coordinator does. What are we doing? And some of them have nothing to do with what's particularly going on. Um, they are just reminders of safety, reminders of what's going on. And, but you have everybody's attention, so you can do that, and you can do the specifics of what's happening today.
and and you, you little things that you may not think of, but make sure the crew knows they can report this and say, oh, Billy Bob over there got a sliver and putting up some scaffolding. Oh, that sliver. I've known of a case where they said, no, it's no big deal. I get slivers all the time. A couple of days go by, starts getting infected and festering up and ended up losing the finger. And then goes back to production and says, by the way, I, I you know, can't order five beers anymore uh, because my finger got infected from that one sliver a week and a half ago. And uh, they said, well, gee, that was a long time. And then the insurance people getting involved and it's all a, a big magosh of stuff. So make sure that they know that they can and should report minor injuries that's going on. And it's your job to make sure that you get that information so you can deal with it accordingly. Um, let's move on from this. Uh, so again, that would be involving your employees. You see how well I'm up on these slides knowing when they're coming up. Um, uh, and so the, the involving the employees then Okay, in what I, actually one of the places I met Jen was a, a, a class that I give once a year during uh, North American Occupational Health and Safety Week, the first week of May, it's to raise awareness, just like to bring those things up, as well as Workers Memorial Day, April 28th, International Day of Mourning for Workers, sorry that's my soapbox for a second, uh, but it's about telling workers what their rights are and what their responsibilities are in helping what's going on. So the biggest thing, how many of you as a producer go to the set every day? How many of you as a producer, you're a lot of times as a pro producers, I've been on shows where uh, uh, on Outbreak, um, because of the way they were trying to get it going, uh, Robert Redford was listed as a producer on the show. They had a trailer for him. He never showed up. I never saw Robert Redford, okay? Yet he was considered a producer. So as we're sitting there talking, is it's a good chance that the person ultimately responsible for all this stuff doesn't know what a grip does and may never be there to see what the hazards are. So that's what, why you've hired us. You've hired me to look into the hazards that grips are involved with. You've looked into people, hired makeup people, so they know what to deal with, with uh, doing uh, the different makeups that are going on. They're actually, uh, in some states, hair and makeup people have to be licensed to do their jobs, okay? So you're getting there and you have to encourage the reporting of hazards by the people. And then make it easy to participate. You want people to be involved. People are showing up. Are you going to be here for the meeting? Okay. Don't start the meeting if someone important is supposed to be there. Don't blow it off like, well, not everybody can be here. There's still you know, half the crew is in the, in the breakfast line. Okay. Make it important for it. Make it easy to participate. Let people know what's going on. One of the biggest problems I've always found uh, is a crew is distrustful of you. Okay, they think you're trying to kill them. You've brought me to this location that is full of hazards and you're trying to kill me. And I read on this bag that says this is how we make frost, that the contents of this bag have been known to cause cancer in laboratory animals. In California, we have Oops. a law that says when you have to have, you have to tell people about that this business contains things that can cause cancer and it's on the door of every grocery store you walk into because there's things in there that cause cancer. So, but a crew sees this, and they see that this dust is in the air, and the special effects guys are using it, and it's putting down, and they're going, oh, this stuff says it causes cancer. Yeah, you give it to, you give uh, 10 times the amount that anybody would ever get every day for the whole life of this thing, and he died of cancer. But the crew needs to know that. Anybody know what an SDS is? Safety data sheet. I'm running out of things. Okay. Um, safety data sheets used to be called MSDSs. Those are my son's boots. He may not want to smell them. Uh, no, he's... So the safety, they used to be MSDSs. They're now SDSs. They are information that is there for the crew about any chemical that is being used on a set, including what happens when you create sawdust. Okay? Because manufactured lumber, what's manufactured lumber? Plywood, okay? lamb beams, silent floor, all kinds of things you use. You, you create sawdust and people are breathing that. 
contains formaldehyde. It contains all kinds of things in it. And people need to know, what is it doing to me? For the most part, nothing. But if the crew isn't told that, if the crew doesn't believe that, they're going to bitch for weeks. And you're going to have to put up with the bitching. Okay? If you tell them up front, it goes away. Tell them, it usually goes away. <laughs> okay? It, but it's a good thing. Be up front. Let them know what's happening. Let them know. They want to know. We're going into this, you know, how often do you ever work in buildings that are no longer uh, deemed habitable for the public? And it's okay that they bring in, it's not that they're not habitable, but they're not habitable for the public. All the time, right? Okay? And the crew's looking at, oh my God, all that stuff up there is asbestos. It's all asbestos. You're, you're exposing us to asbestos. It's very hard to tell what asbestos is. And there are places that are full of asbestos that's encapsulated. It's perfectly fine. There's no problem. It's a good idea to tell the crew, yes, there's asbestos. We called the Georgia consultation people. to say, Jenny, come and check this out. Jenny came down and did an air quality um, test for it and said, eh, it's fine. She'll do it better than that. But she'll basically say, eh, it's fine. Okay? And that's what we need because we just want to put people at ease. We want to let the crew know that they're, they're there. Yes, sir. And it can be small. Oh, I'm sorry. It can be small, innocuous stuff that we all use on a daily basis. I've seen two members of the uh, set dressing crew want to clean something up. One comes in with the Windex. We all use Windex, right? It's a, it's a great cleaner, a great uh, dessert beverage, whatever, however you want to use it. Uh, then another one came in with bleach. Ah, ammonia and bleach. What do we get with that? Mustard gas, yes, people dying, or even super glue. How many people have been hurt or killed by a bottle of super glue? Well, you wouldn't be here if you were killed, I suppose. But a very good friend of mine, one of the top pyro guys in the business, and he blew up the Death Star, and he uh, destroyed the White House in Independence Day, um, and was really, really good, really, really safe. But he had loaded a bomb into a particular prop, and it was in his truck, and a prop person came in with super glue and the kicker that makes it sit instantaneously, or set instantaneously. And the heat that was generated on that detonated the bomb, and it just blew out the back of his truck, and he got his back scorched off. I mean, like the safest guy in the business, my friend who's now in a hospital missing part of his back because of a bottle of super glue. So it's little things like this that if you're not sure, those SDSs are really, really important for your crew to know. And if they're not familiar, you need to make sure they get familiar with this stuff. You know, again, the simple stuff, so. I just wanted to <clears throat> touch on the, the management um, leadership part because I mean, I think we're, this is a group of, of folks who probably do smaller projects, shorter projects, but you're in charge of a lot of people um, for a, an amount of time, and it's a small community, and you probably work with a lot of the same people, and you have a reputation. I mean, one thing to consider as, a, as an individual, as a leader of others, is to come up with a, a statement, your own safety mission statement. I mean, you know, there's letters from the CEO. There's letters from leaderships and all sorts of companies. Our, our industry isn't really structured corporately in, in, in many ways on a production, but having a, a top-level statement of, of how safety is meaningful to you and you care about the worker safety and the things you're going to do for it, it probably goes a long way. And, and that might even, I mean, it's going to make people want to work for you. It's going to make people trust you as a producer. I just thought it was when I was sort of doing some research into some of the OSHA guidance, uh, I saw some examples of that. I, I just thought that was an interesting concept. Um, also, when, when giving people the start paperwork and their rights and responsibilities, um, have them sign off on that, obviously. I mean, that's a studio practice to have people sign off on that so they know that they got it. Um, just something to also consider as a producer. And one of the things with that, because unfortunately it happens, and this goes to the commitment, is there was uh, one of the studios handing out start paperwork and there were like four places that the crew had to sign that they had read the code of safe practices provided by the employer. That wasn't in the start paperwork. So the commitment, if you're gonna ask people to sign that they've read something, you gotta make sure it's there so they be able to read it. <laughs> Put it in the packet, so. Now, other things, as you can see by this slide here, are the local hazards. And of course, for your area here, you've got lots of tree trees and wilderness, and uh, Margaret, I'm sure, would be more of an expert on this. Go thing. ahead and hand me that. Uh, other, I don't trust you guys with the mics. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, well, one thing I wanted to um, 
briefly touch on in, as far as the informing employees. I know that you've heard the word community a lot today. And um, personally, I think that the culture of our industry has gotten a lot better over just the few years that I've worked in it. Um, but I think it's incredibly important to try to facilitate an atmosphere of empowerment amongst everyone on the crew. Um, you know, people should feel like, especially because at the end of the day, you probably spend more time with the people you work with a lot of times than you do with your family. You know, people should feel like we are a family, we look out for each other, and um, it shouldn't be a scenario where the squeaky wheel never works again, but people should be empowered and feel like they can bring to topics up to you that they're concerned about, or, you know, they know. I mean, a lot of times, you know, obviously other people on the film set have a better idea about how much, you know, uh, weight this can hold or, um, you know, any number of scenarios. Um, so as far as that's concerned, um, you know, to the extent possible, I think, you know, empowering the people on our crews to speak up anytime they have a concern is, is gravely important for our industry.